Children at Play by Heidi Britz Chrysalis. Forward. For 25 years, this book has inspired those who care about children. In an age when play is valued less and less, it stands out as a reminder of why play always has been part of childhood and why we must not stand by and allow it to die out. During these years, the teachers in Waldorf kindergartens, where play is a central part of the education, have witnessed a steady decline in children's spontaneous ability to play. Modern children are accustomed to manufacture toys with defined purposes. Television and films that present someone else's imagination, computers, that use other people's programs and classes in dance or sports in which someone instructs them in what to do. As a result, today's children can no longer bring forth their own strong creative impulse to play. While a trained teacher can help children to regain the world of play, it is a lengthy and difficult process. It would be so much better to keep the spirit of play alive in children in the first place and not let it be damaged, for it is the foundation of physical, social and mental health. Why is children's play declining? One reason is that in the United States and around the world, educators and parents have become increasingly preoccupied with early academics. There is a tremendous push for getting children to read at younger ages and this spills over into other areas of learning as well. One public school kindergarten teacher told me that in her district kindergarten curriculum was set by the legislator which demanded 20 minutes each of writing, reading, mathematics, science, social science, etc. Each morning for children ages four and a half to six, she then glanced over her shoulder, lowered her voice and said to me, you know, they don't allow any time for play, but I break the law every day and let my children play for 15 minutes. Similar stories can be told all over the world. The absence of open-ended play is also a problem for the school child who used to create games with neighborhood friends, adjusting the rules as needed. Instead, from age 5 onward, many children join sports teams and are taught to play according to someone else's rules. They have little opportunity to exercise their own imagination or creative judgment. One parent who coached a soccer for five-year-olds found it painful. All they want is to get out on the field and play with the ball. Instead, they are supposed to be taught rules and skills. What are we doing to our children? Another unfortunate result was seen by a college sports teacher. He loved baseball and bemoaned the fact that in high school and college, when young people were ready to play the game, most had lost the interest in it. As children, they had participated in organized baseball with its stress and focus on winning. By adolescence, they were burned out. Why is play so important and what happens to the children when it's eroded? Studies in Germany, Israel and the United States show basically the same results regarding the importance of play. Children who engage in creative play in early childhood tend to do better in all spheres of life as they grow older. They excel not only academically but also socially, emotionally and physically. They tend to be more harmonious and less aggressive. They show a better understanding of other people. If children today are not playing as well as their earlier children did, does this mean they are suffering in some way? 
According to research in the United States and Germany, there has been a serious deterioration in children's health over the past few decades. While the traditional childhood diseases have been nearly eradicated in developed countries, children instead show great increases in sleep and eating disorders, nervous ailments and stress, hyperactivity and asthma and allergies. The overall decline in children's health in the United States is staggering. Government statistics show that in 1960 about 1.5 percent of children were considered disabled. By 1993 the number had grown about 6.5 percent and among poor children it was 10 percent. The conditions of modern life are endangering the health of our children and their declining health goes hand in hand with their declining ability to play. What do children need for a healthy life? One of the things is a relaxed, rhythmic lifestyle with plenty of time for creative play. They also need to see adults who enjoy their work and engage in it with active will, especially the basic human task of cooking, sewing, woodworking and the like. Children love to imitate adults at work and this imitation is a cornerstone of play. Children also need simple natural play materials out of which they can create their own toys rather than finished toys that are defined and determine the play. Children need a chance to interact with the world of nature and with human beings rather than with the technological world of televisions, videos and computers. One can go on and on with such a list. In general, children thrive with a healthy, simple life full of loving warmth, protected by secure boundaries and with opportunities to explore the world through play. The children entering our kindergarten today are a wonderful group. They have a deep awareness of life and a great love of the earth and all that is on it. As one six-year-old recently said to me from the depths of his being, I just love the earth. I just love it. Such children need a healthy upbringing that includes plenty of opportunity for play so that the love they feel now can ripen and become deeds of service later. It is good to have this book back in print for it is, a, for it is like a beacon of light to all who value play and want to include it in a child's life. Joan Alman Chair Wall of Kindergarten Association of North America Preface All the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players they have their exits and their entrances and one man in his time plays many parts we may pursue Shakespeare's image and say that it is as children that these players rehearse their parts in their own form of play through the innumerable activities and games of childhood. There is nothing that human beings do, know, think, hope and fear that has not been attempted, experienced practiced or at least anticipated in children's games. In attempting to traverse this very wide field without losing our bearings, we shall, like the melancholy Jacques, have to take it bit by bit. Through as he does we begin with the infant mewling and puking in the nurse's arms our progress will not necessarily be strictly chronological as is, our emphasis being rather on the different qualities of play which may extend through more than one phase of childhood. 
we shall remember too that behind the visible scenes lies the invisible, the human being, though bound by the laws of space and time and tied to earth, stems from eternity and belongs to the cosmos, an animal by reason of his body, a life like tree and flower committed to human society, he remains nevertheless related in his inmost being to the all-embracing world of the spirit, that which is inmost and that which is all-embracing come so close together that it can be found difficult to define the boundary between them. To adopt the words of Prospero, these our actors are all spirits. Space and Time Although the child occupies the surrounding space with his body, although with each heartbeat and breath he measures time, the nature of time and space is so great that an effort the nature of time and space is such a great effort is needed to the part of the infant to perceive and investigate them. He experiences and becomes aware of the connection between time and space by means of innumerable early exercises and games. Is it near or far? attainable or unattainable. This makes the first attempts of grasping an object into adventure. The rattle can be caught hold of, but not the brightly shining moon. The time between seeing the milk bottle in his mother's hands and tasting the first drops tests the child's patience to the utmost. St. Paul says that though patience comes experience, but the little child is able to develop only an elementary kind of patience, a patience closely connected with trust through a regular repetition of events. The development of trust thus already starts with the infant. We must already be at pains not to disturb this development by deceiving him. If we show him the milk bottle, then the meal should also follow. If we tell the child we are talking, if we tell the child we are taking him for a walk, then it should be only when we are really thinking, when we are really taking him out and not just make him look at his head or begin to wave because we want to parade his intelligence to relatives. Children are not clockwork machines. They cannot be turned into them for a time, and you can show off all their paces, but eventually you will have to pay dearly for it, if not always at the same time in the same way. By means of what he sees, grass move. Let's go again for drops. The child finds its relationship to space and time, to the laws of nature, and to all those things which can later be measured, weighed, or calculated. From the age of twelve months, one of my godsons devoted himself to many weeks of his own game with space and quantity. Whenever he had a large number of similar things at his disposal, such as balls, little bricks, plums, and other fruit, or even six shining red plastic plates, he would distribute those objects around the room. He would look at the results for a while, and then head for each piece on his unsteady legs, laboriously pick it up, and so gather them all together again. He would look with satisfaction at what he had collected and then start to distribute them all over again. Still more pleasing than the rattle of the plates or the rolling of the plums was the way in which paper handkerchiefs floated silently to the ground, where they lay silent and flat on the carpet until they were again heaped 
as a loose mass on the sofa. For weeks the mother wisely left the child at these games. In the same way she went for months with her son to the park where day after day he clambered up the same little slope to come clambering or rolling it down again. Depending on the weather, the child was covered in dust or mud or snow when he returned home, but always very happy and deeply satisfied. He had practiced controlling his body and, gain, and gaining command of his environment and had enjoyed the pleasure of repetition. Richard Harlacher writes, for the child, toys are completely unpoetical experimental objects with which the, to penetrate the hollowed realms of physics. The exploration of physics therefore already starts long before secondary school, and the teacher of physics would have a hard time if he had to start his teaching without the child's preschool experiments ball, rattle, spoon, all are dropped on the floor. The sound is different each time. Through the continuous repetition, the ear learns to distinguish the different qualities of the sounds made by different objects. Many years later, when studying physics at school, he will stand leaning over a bridge testing how long something takes to hit the water or the crew of a passing boat. He, was, uh, he has meanwhile reached the stage of Galileo. As soon as the young child's strength allows, plates and bowls become experimental objects. They sail through the air until a door or cupboard offers resistance and they fall to the ground dropped of all their strengths. Experience of space is broadened in all directions from the purely vertical downward movement to the horizontal backward and forward and the vertical upward movements. As he becomes more expert in throwing, the child can begin to control and observe the trajectory of an object. A few years later, it only remains to learn the proper name, parabola, and how to calculate it, of course. The shining spoon he throws serves as a kind of luminous marker of the trajectory that helps to coordinate the target, the optic nerve and the force needed to throw it. The dimensions of space are conquered, distance is included in the child's increasing skill of judgment, sound raging comes from next. The noise from the cupboard returns faster than from the door. The effect of these efforts is ascertained, and the experience used next time. If the balls and wooden blocks are of different colors, then the game also serves to develop a sense of color. A ball flying through a patch of sunlight which lights it up for a moment enriches the child's experience of color. A further development task plays when the child tries to pull a teddy bear, which he has thrown out back into his cot through the bars right at right angles to the bars, at first complaining, then raging, and finally laughing through its tears, having finally grasped the principle of how to do it. We adults are wrong to find this funny. What it does the budding engineer think if we do not take his efforts seriously or if we become impatient and quote unquote help him because he manages to pull the lid on the cardboard box correctly only at the tenth try. But this is by no means all that children learn with their first toys. Hands, eyes, ears, nose, and mouth all play a part in their discovery. Toys should really not be made of dead plastic material. How many people can still remember the different tastes of food? Unvarnished, of course. Perhaps even freshly cut piece from a willow branch 
leather taste and smells different from rubber or perhaps orris root, out of fashion now as something for the first teeth to bite on. If you want to attach a bell to the pram, do not take the first one that comes in your hand. Rather try out a whole selection until you find one with a pleasing sound. We should not be indifferent to the materials that surround the child for the very reason that it does not understand them and because all impressions of assimilated is indiscriminately and at random. Modern, psycholo modern psychological and medical research continually comes across the decisive influence that the impressions and experiences of early childhood have on the physical and spiritual development of a human being. The catalogue of parental mistakes that create complexes and frustrations quote unquote, in the infant is of such magnitude and varies so much from one author to another that often the mere study of them can create quote unquote complexes and frustrations in the poor parents. Since every mistake has a corresponding opposite, it is no wonder that confusion and insecurity become widespread in nurseries and at the minds of parents. One example, the infant needs attention, care and stimulation. If these are missing, it falls and will end up in hospital. This we have learned. My sister made me aware that the opposite fault and its consequences in dealing with children. She has worked for many years as a children's nurse in families, hospitals and homes and has found that the early experimental games of children are often in interrupted unnecessarily. A young mother sits by the cot of her first child for the second there is already less time and watches how it tries over and over again to place a red cube on a blue one on this point. After a while she has watched this long enough and asks, And where is your lovely dolly? The child abandons its bricks, looks for the doll and begins to lick its face licks and licks until the mother brings the teddy on the scene grr grr here comes the old teddy the child turns away from the doll and takes hold of the teddy it twists him around in its hands and finally moves one leg up and down up and down until well the mother becomes bored and draws the child's attention to its ball Politely, it lets herself be distracted a third time and plays with the ball. In this way, the mother spends an enjoyable afternoon and is entirely unaware how she disrupts her child's preservance and ability to concentrate. She prevents it getting used to preserving at an, pre preserving at an activity and thoroughly occupies itself with something over any length and time. She will then later complain that the four-year-old will not stay at any game. He will continually hanging on her apron strings. What shall I do now, mommy? Still later comes trouble with homework, which will take the whole evening because he cannot concentrate longer than a minute on his work before having to look at something else. Finally, the school psychologist is asked for an effective and speedy solution to the problem. If he does not have one, then he is just not of use. Yet, it was the mother herself who spoiled the child's perseverance and staying power, whether with the best of intentions or without even thinking about it. When modern educational psychologists and those are defending the teachers of children to read as early as possible record of a child does not remain longer than 75 at most 90 seconds at one and the same activity, they can only have made their observations on children already disturbed 
their ability to concentrate. There are infants whose staying power can be absolutely counted on. I remember two like that. Neither of them had reached the age of two when the following incidents happened. One was visiting his aunt, in whose garden there was a very high swing. Before lunch, the small guests who had already that hit the small guest who already had his meal was placed on the swing, given a good push. After lunch, someone went down, lifted him from the now only gently moving swing, on which he had spent the interval with great pleasure. The other one was placed by his mother on a stool, which stood on a chair at the table. He threw two pins in a glass bottle, shook them about, and then emptied them on the table. Thereupon he struck the, stuck the pins carefully into a pincushion, enjoyed the result, and then he pulled them out again and dropped them tinkingly into the char. He continued doing this until his mother came back from the dairy. She had no need to fear that the child would become bored with his activity before he returned. However, this mother could not have relied so firmly on the perseverance of any of her other children at that game. Now, one need, one need not think that such great persistence is just a sign of natural indolence, not to say a downward laziness. The boy on the swing has grown into a specially hard-working man, and the child with the bottle has also grown up to be a lively and use to be lively and useful at many things. After coming to grips with surrounding object, the next step in conquering the space is to start moving oneself. Crawling is the first temporary solution. Some children jump in this stage, others perfect it into an astonishing degree. Mommy, if my little sister gets ill, she will have to crawl to the hospital, won't she? Reflected a brother of nearly three. Hardly has the child learned to crawl before it tries to gain height. A delightful means of discovering differences in height is the flight of stairs. The wooden flight in a living room being the most comfortable, of course. Crawling up can be learned quickly. This can be also done more ceremoniously as, for example, by putting a favorite building brick on the next step before climbing after it. It is much difficult to come down. It is quite a relief for the mother when she knows that the child turns rea reliably each time and does not try to make a descent head first. Only then have the stairs been conquered and for many years they remain a favorite spot of playing. A. A. Milne expresses his particular delight of childhood in his poem Halfway Down. Halfway down the stairs is the stair where I sit. There isn't any other stair quite like it. I'm not at the bottom. I'm not at the top. So this is the stair where I always stuck. It is not only a step is the ideal height for a sitting child, but also the adult too, sitting on the stairs, has suddenly become accessible in a wonderful way. The child can sit down, so it is just as tall as the adult or even taller, lap, shoulders, hair. No one needs to lift the child. With a few steps it can reach where it wants to go. But then, amidst great rejoicing, the first steps are taken upright on two legs. Space, space which has grown familiar through play, is conquered step by step. It is an afford one step after another, all one's life. The small child will often hold its hand out. Help me, 
or even both arms, carry me. And for weeks after learning to walk, a child will always trot about with its arms raised without, however, however expecting or wishing adult help. What is it that helps it along until it is secure on its feet? Children love to be swung forward by the arms between two adults. All his life man tries to save steps and surmount obstacles by the easiest means. There are the scooters and tricycles, the first real bicycle, sledges and skis, roller and ice skates. Later comes the elation of having a moped putting away beneath you putting away beneath you with the wind blowing in your face and so it continues from the car to the rocket but before man learned to drive or even ride he had to explore his environment step by step this also applies to the child the experience of seeing a distant goal gradually come closer of being able to take only one step at a time is part of human life. Somebody on foot experiences something different from somebody who sees the world from his car and he gets to know the absolutely basic measurement of human pace. As an introduction to his geometry lessons, my father used to tell his class to sketch an outline of the school buildings and grounds on the scale of four millimeters to two paces, all the drawings were different. The smaller the steps, the bigger the drawing, but in themselves they were all to scale. This way of experiencing one's own scale in relation to the general measurement of the meter derived from the world's circumference had a strong effect on the children. In trying to cover distance faster with less effort, it may be, it may well be that we find something at other at the other end, in which is more important than the experiences of the journey. But what is really gained if time is just whirled away, or even killed? Time, of which each of us possesses only a limited amount cannot be bought or rented, there is a strange law in connection with it, which is again related to the human scale. If time is filled, it passes very quickly, though it remains a long time and in great detail in the memory, and provides the material for innumerable stories. Time, which is empty, on the other hand, passes very slowly and is hardly remembered at all. We speak of boredom, when time is empty like that. I must still have been very small when my grandmother started giving me tips and advice on how to fill empty time, periods of waiting, and the like, by recalling important memories for which otherwise there is not much time or poems learned by heart. I am sure these conversations with my grandmother have contributed to the fact that boredom has always remained something unknown to me. Whiling away time is just as sinister and suspect as the expression as killing it. Who could have had an interest in making people while away their allotted time? Who is it? that tries to prevent man's thinking, feeling and willing, being strengthened and coordinated and encourage their dissipation.